I'm always scanning the headlines. I'm scanning my news sources for investment ideas. And over the past few months, uh, I've seen a recurrence of a ton of articles that are pointing towards what might be a, a very rare, a very good investment opportunity right now. And that is in the US Treasuries market. So after I started to notice um, so many of these articles pointing at Treasuries as a you know great opportunity, as so many of them have touted, I started to devote a bit more of my time exploring what that opportunities might be. And it's more specifically, of course, um, how I might be able to capitalize on the opportunity. Now, a bit of a spoiler alert here. I am buying into the story, but we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Before I get into that, a second part of this story uh, really helped me out personally, and I want to share that with you here. Coincidentally, uh, coinciding with my due diligence in this space about a month or so ago, I was heading to Toronto to speak at the Money Show. Now, while we were there, I wanted to take advantage of you know being just a, a couple of blocks down the, the street from uh, the guys over at Hamilton ETFs. And we've done work with Hamilton on the channel here before. I thought I'm so close to them, it'd be nice to go to their head office and, and chat with uh, the folks there. While we were at the show, I did in fact uh, visit their offices and I sat down with uh, Pat Somerville, who is a senior partner. He's the head of business development um, at Hamilton and also Nick Picard, who is Hamilton's chief option strategist. First off, I had a really nice visit with the guys. It was kind of nice to be in their own home turf and see where they spend their days. I uh, talked to them on the phone or do Zoom meetings once in a while. So it's nice to see them in their own environment. But also while I was there, they uh, advised me, they told me that they were on the verge of launching a new ETF that they felt might be interesting to me. Sadly, while I was there, I was there you know, a bit early in the day, they couldn't actually share the details of the fund with me because at the time it hadn't received uh, final approval yet from the regulators. But they did agree that once it was live, once they did have that approval, they'd, we'd reconnect and they'd answer any questions that I had about the fund. Literally, within an hour or so after having left the offices, I got an email from Pat and I learned that the, the new fund had in fact been approved. And they shared with me uh, that they would be launching what is the first of its kind ETF in Canada. It's a fixed income ETF that has a covered call overlay. And this really piqued my interest. It's a space I've been looking at anyway, and to add a covered call overlay, uh, I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I'd like to learn more about that. We also thought it would be cool to partner up and I would create a video that shared my process, the questions that I had as I was exploring the opportunities in this new space here in Canada uh, with you, with our viewers, but also for the folks at Hamilton to be able to tell you the ins and outs about their new fund. So, you know, I saw win, win, win. I get to win because I get to go straight to the horse's mouth and get my questions answered. That's an opportunity that not everyone has. Hamilton will win because I can share with you their new fund. Also, most importantly, you get to win because you're going to be able to benefit from the work that I put in as I researched this opportunity. Let's start right at the beginning here and I can share with you why U.S. Treasuries came onto my radar um, in the first place. Everything that I've looked at over the past little while has been suggesting that following such a disappointing performance in fixed income, where they really haven't behaved um, as expected, uh, especially during 2022, uh, we uh, have seen an opportunity that's being created here. And we see headline after headline after headline, article after article that highlights this. When it comes to fixed income investments, the yield plays a very important role. The basic concept of this math is that when the yield uh, rises on a, on a fixed income security, the price is gonna go down. When the yield goes down, the price is gonna go up. Or you can think of it the opposite way. When price goes down, the yield is gonna go up. When prices go up, the yield is gonna go down. I wanna use a 10-year chart that shows this, uh, this concept very clearly. When the yield went up, we saw the price of those treasuries drop. Since 2020, as this chart shows here, yields have had a very, very great run. This is the US 20-year treasury. Whether we look at the 10, we look at the 20, we look at the 30, they've all had similar performance over the last couple of years. And yes, we can see that the price has dropped accordingly. Again, I'm using TLT as the proxy here for the 20-year bond market. And we can see that with the price having dropped as much as it has over the last couple of years, we've seen the corresponding yield uh, rising. My thesis here is that these yields aren't going to stay as high as they are right now forever. And when they do correct, and it, it truly, it's not a matter of, of if, it, it is when, they will, um, there will be an opportunity to capture the capital gains. That's primarily what interested me in this space right now. But of course, you have to remember bonds also provide income. They provide cash flow into a portfolio. And this is where uh, the new Hamilton fund I find very interesting. The fund that they've launched is actually called the Hamilton Yield Maximizer ETF. The ticker is HBND um, or HBOND. And it buys U.S. Treasuries mostly long term, but it does have a 20% uh, exposure to short and medium term bonds as well. And, and this is the kicker to me, it has a covered call overlay. 
The target yield of the fund is 10 plus percent annually, payable in monthly distributions. So as I sat down to really drill into whether this fund would be suitable for my own portfolio, um, I did arrange that call uh, with Pat and Nick back in Toronto. Uh, I recorded the call, we had a Zoom meeting, and they said that they, it would be fine with them if I shared their answers to my questions. So what I'm gonna do in this video is I'm gonna weave those answers, or their, their answers, um, into the questions that I had for them. So I'm gonna start with, you know, go through a series of questions that I had uh, that I felt uh, would be applicable to, to this type of investment. So starting right from the fact that I, I do know that Hamilton has a very strong record of, of using covered call overlay strategies with equity funds. That's kind of their, their bread and butter to this point. We've covered that extensively um, on our channel here. But this is the first fund of its kind in Canada. And the logical question that I had was, how does that cover call, covered call overlay apply to a totally different asset class, right? Can I expect uh, the same type of process can I expect uh, the this, the fund to act the same? What are the key differences? So I asked that question and both uh, Pat and Nick had some input into the questions. So I'm gonna play to you now what they had to say. Okay, so yeah, so Mark, so it's been a, as you know, it's a very popular strategy um, for yield oriented investors for, for quite some time. And up until now, it's really only been used on the equity side. So we're the first here in Canada to launch a fixed income covered call ETF. It's very similar to our equity yield maximizer ETFs, uh, HMAX and UMAX, um, that Nick Picard and his team manage. Um, and basically we're applying the same principles. We're using an income first approach. Um, we're writing at the money options on roughly 50% of the portfolio. Um, but the big difference here is rather than equities, um, we're, we're writing options on US Treasury ETFs. Uh, to generate uh, a higher yield. So you know that's it's a that's a great question. And what's really happened in the last uh, ten years is the huge growth of uh, bond ETFs in general. Uh, you know, a lot of them are more recent than uh, equity ETFs. And so uh, you know, before you know the last kind of ten years, there wasn't really um, uh, that many bond ETFs or even a liquid options market on those ETFs to do a, a cover call strategy. Um, so in the past few years, we've seen both the liquidity of the underlying bond ETFs and their growth and the liquidity in the options market for those ETFs really increase. Uh, the second big uh, reason is what we've seen in the interest rate market, uh, which is the increased volatility that we've seen in interest rate. After the global financial crisis, if you recall, uh, rates pretty much went to zero pretty quickly uh, and stayed there for a long time. And, the Federal Reserve really kept a lid on interest rate volatility for, for a long time until now, uh, where we now we have the kind of the opposite. We have interest rate hikes, quantitative tightening. All of this is creating a lot more volatility in the bond market and really, uh, you know, helping uh, this, this uh, you know, the outlook for the for a cover call strategy on, on this asset class. So to summarize what the guy said there, Pat had noted that the, the process is very similar to what they have with their equity series. The, uh, the mandate is income first. That's primarily what their objective is here. Uh, they also use that at the money strategy. So that, that increases the uh, revenue from the premiums that they would attract there. Um, Nick mentioned the bond ETF, uh, the whole field has been growing uh, very strongly lately. He did note that it, this wasn't really a fund that would have been practical um, over the past while just because yields have been so low. Uh, he noted that volatility has increased here. Uh, my main takeaway is that the, you know from a structural perspective, there's no main difference. There's no key material difference between the, the strategy using on an equity fund um, or on this fixed income fund. Uh, I then asked them about correlation and I kind of went back to this question in 2022 where, where the, uh, the drop in uh, fixed income surprised so many people and it didn't provide that protection that we all you know, had, had come to expect that bonds would in rough e equity markets. And for example, if we just compare quickly here the uh, the credit crisis era, we can see the orange line here is XBB, which is a you know generic Canadian bond fund, XIC, representative of the Toronto Stock Exchange. And this is more like what we would expect to see when the when the markets did correct so harshly during that time period. We saw bonds kind of just chug along there. They have a little bit of ups and downs, but they did provide a lot of ballast to the portfolio. That's something that, you know, yeah, that's, that's the way that we think they should work. Now, if we compare that to 2022, we can see an entirely different situation. The blue line here, uh, again, this is the same XIC, but we see all of that volatility and negative return. Well, bonds, did basically the same thing. They dropped in value 
And during this time period, uh, investors really became uh, disillusioned. So my question to Nick specifically was, how would I expect H-Bond to perform if these um, conditions were repeated? And this is what he had to say. Well, I mean, the good news is we're no longer going to be starting from from uh, where we were in 2020, where basically, you know, interest rates were at close to record lows. Uh, and so that really, I mean, that was the major part of the impact of the drawdown that we saw since, where... You know, we haven't seen a drawdown like this in uh, the bond market and the long term bond market in uh, I think it's over uh, 100 years. And this is going to be the uh, if, if we stay where we are right now, this is going to be the third year in a row that we've seen negative returns in the long bond. We haven't seen that, uh, you know, in hundreds of years as well, according to some of the research that I've read. Going back to how we would expect a bond cover call strategy to do or H bond in particular. Um, a couple of things would help outperform uh, the, the, the long bond return in a kind of a, a bear market scenario. First of all, it's the premiums that you receive uh, that gives you on the cover calls, that gives you a cushion and reduces the volatility. Uh, so that's going to work to your benefit, that 10 plus yield that you're receiving. Uh, the second thing that's going to work to your benefit is the fact that even though we have close to basically 80% of the portfolio is made of long bonds. We also have 20% of the portfolio, which is in shorter maturities uh, with short-term and medium-term treasuries. And so that portion of the portfolio, while I won't participate if we do have a bull market, it is going to cushion you uh, in, in if we further if we see further rate hikes. Uh, so uh, both those things I think will work in your favor. And so when you're looking at your fixed income portfolio allocation overall, uh, sure, this definitely has some uh, long-term exposure, but not as much as just an outright long bond uh, ETF. And also, um, it has that cover call dampening effect and some of that shorter, some of those short-term uh, maturities. Key points from Nick there. Uh, we started from a very unusual position with yields having been so uh, low. Premiums uh, would provide a cushion as well as the fact that there's a short term or medium term uh, element to the portfolio that would also uh, you know, have a, a cushion on the downside, should provide some protection. Uh, yes, he mentioned that when, we, when yields do drop, we will participate in the downside. That's the nature of a covered call fund because you do own the assets. So if they drop, so, uh, so will the value of the fund. But the losses here will be mitigated by the, the income that comes into the portfolio uh, more. It'll, it'll take away, it'll be less of a drop than you would get just from owning those bonds directly. Now, the next topic I asked them about was yields since 2020. This is something, you know, we've seen the yields spike up basically uh, over that time period. And we can see on this chart here what that's looked like. Now, at some point, obviously, they're going to cycle back, which means that they will drop again. So when the Fed does cut rates, uh, which, which they will, um, how can I expect a fund like this to react? So an opposite scenario that we just looked at, and here's what each of Pat and Nick had to say. Yeah, well, that, you know, further to what Pat was just saying, uh, you know, just like you would probably not do as, you know, you would probably uh, not do as badly on, uh, you know, in a bear market for bonds, you're not, you're only going to get some of the growth uh, in a bond bull market. This is really a product that's uh, focused on getting, uh, income today at the expense of, um, uh, you know, some of the growth in, in, uh, in recovery of the long bond. My, despite that, we're, we're still going to have uh, 80% of uh, the portfolio in long bonds and we're going to have, but with 50% of the portfolio covered. So there's only going to be like 30% of the portfolio that has completely uncovered long bond exposure. But that that part of the portfolio will benefit from uh, a drop in uh, rates. So if you think that you know tomorrow, uh, you know the Fed is going to reverse course and lower rates aggressively and buy, you know, re return to QE and buy the long bond, uh, then we would see a big move in long bond ETFs, and you know, H bond wouldn't capture all that upside for sure. Uh, so this is more a strategy that you're looking for. If you think you know we're we might we might have bottomed out on uh, on interest rates we've we've seen a big correction we're not going back to you know one percent long bond yields anytime soon but in the meantime 
you know, I want some exposure to fixed income and, and I need some tax efficient yield. Sure. Yeah, so with a strategy like this, if rates were to stay where they are now, we would expect H bond to outperform uh, because of the cash premiums it receives on the option strategy. And then on the other hand, if rates continue to trend higher, the extra premium income generated would provide a bit of a buffer as well from a total return perspective. Um, and we also have some exposure to some shorter duration uh, U.S. Treasuries in the portfolio, which can help offset some of the volatility that you see on the longer end. So Nick commented here that the upside uh, will be will be limited. If we get a, a bond bull market, we're only going to get a part of that growth because of the covered call strategy is capping the upside. Um, we get higher income today, but at the expense of the upside. Uh, Pat did also add that if rates stay current or if rates straight stay flat, uh, we can expect H bond to outperform the index as a general due again to that premium income. And uh, also if rates, if rates do trend higher, again, that extra premium will act as a buffer um, in the portfolio. Now, the next question I had for them was, why not just wait? My theory here, we've seen all the headlines I talked about earlier. We're seeing this generational opportunity um, in the treasury space. If we believe that we're going to see a reversal there, why don't we just wait and, and capture all of the capital gains? Why would we... Um, cap the upside. And this is something, this is kind of where I was really leaning uh, in the first place. Uh, a couple of very interesting things that Nick had to say, I'll share those with you now. What I would say to that is, you know, when you're looking at how H bond works um, in your portfolio, I think it's, it, it's just an allocation, partly, you know, a partial allocation to your fixed income portfolio. It doesn't have to be all of your fixed income portfolio. So I would recommend even like, you know, to have some uncovered you know, long bond exposure, um, just because that from a, from a risk reward perspective, I think that looks, you know, uh, that, that, that is good portfolio diversification. However, um, you know, nobody's that good at timing the market necessarily. And so, and so in, a, in a situation where uh, you need more income and, you know, the markets kind of just stay there for a while, that's where the cover call strategy, you know, does better. Um, so I, I would say, even if you think that bonds will go in a rally, uh, you could still have, you know, a small allocation to H bond to meet your income needs, uh, and then have more of a uncovered allocation. I think that can still work. The key thing I took away here from Nick was uh, that you can allocate a partial uh, portion of your fixed income slice um, into this space. And I thought that was a very uh, responsible answer on his part. He does recommend, if that's your thesis, that you would still maintain uh, some uncovered uh, space there so that you can capitalize fully on the capital gains uh, if they are to come along. He did reiterate, it's hard to time the market. And that is true. And last point, he said, if you do need income, this is an option. So again, a partial exposure here to provide that higher income that you would get just uh, as opposed to owning the fixed income uh, product directly. The next question I posed to the guys is they have a mandate of writing calls on up to 50% of the portfolio. My question was, is there a minimum? Are they going to always have some covered calls written? Uh, also, what can I expect during most times? In other words, if I'm holding this fund three years from today, will it look the same? So Nick, uh, Nick took uh, time to answer this question and here's his answer. The coverage can change depending on uh, market conditions, but at the end of the day, we want to be able to generate the premium that we need to uh, generate uh, the monthly distributions that we'll be paying out. Uh, right now we're targeting kind of a 10% plus yield. Um, you know, the market conditions do change quite a bit, but what we have seen um, in, uh, you know, historically uh, in this market is that, you know, we, we don't need to write more than 50% of the fund uh, to generate uh, the, the kind of distributions that we're targeting. So there's no real um, minimum, but, you know, right now the, there's only, uh, TLT is only 50% of the fund. So we technically can't write more than that. Uh, and I wouldn't expect that, uh, the volatility would get so low um, in in these bond ETFs that we would need to um, write more than that to, to achieve our distributions. The key takeaways for me here is Nick said, yeah, that allocation can change. But he reminded me that the funds, uh, you know, the whole purpose of it is to generate um, income. History shows that 50% should be sufficient. They, they shouldn't need to write more than that. Um, he doesn't expect the volatility to get so low that they would need to write more on there. Now, I, I piggyback, piggybacked off that and I went into the volatility question. And 
Uh, you know, we're more familiar with volatility on the equity side, right? We see the VIX all the time. We, we follow that. And it's, it's much more in the news than it is in fixed income. But I asked Nick, um, what do I as an investor, uh, you know, and this is an area I don't know a lot about, uh, what do I as an investor need to know as, when it comes to fixed, um, fixed income and volatility? And uh, here's what Nick had to say. You know, what is volatility? Volatility is how much an asset price moves up or down, uh, you know, uh, historically. Um, Traditionally, equities um, have generally higher volatility than, than fixed income. However, in the fixed income market, uh, the longer the maturity of the bond, uh, the more interest rates will affect the price of that bond. And so generally what happens with the long bond is that it tends to be a lot more volatile than the shorter term maturities, which is why we can use a cover call strategy, uh, in this case for H bond on, on, on the long bond ETFs, because uh, long bond volatility tends to be higher than, than the shorter term volatility. The second thing that's happened uh, you know, in the past few years is that we've, we've now seen um, interest rate volatility say, stay uh, fairly high, uh, even relative to uh, equity volatility. Whereas the VIX has come back down to well, until recently, at least it's come back down to kind of a average median level. On the interest rate side, we're back to the volatility levels that we've always seen pre-global financial crisis. So that's the interesting thing about this product is, you know, previous to the global financial crisis, interest rate volatility was relatively high or average, I guess. And then after the global financial crisis with the Fed intervening in the market, that was kind of subdued for years and years and years. And now we're seeing this, this volatility kind of revert back to the levels it was before um, uh, 2008. Key takeaways from that, uh, traditionally equities have had higher volatility, more volatility than the fixed income market. Now, with covered call options, volatility is good. You get higher premiums, right? Uh, as the volatility is higher, longer term bonds, um, have uh, there's there's a more uh, a stronger correlation. There's more of an effect when interest rates change. You would expect the the price of the bonds to change. That equals um, higher volatility. Um, H bond focuses on long uh, long bonds, so it can generate higher premium income. Nick did talk about the VIX and with equities now. It's sort of you know it's not really really high. It's not really uh, low right now. It's more uh, along lines with historic norms. Uh, but on the uh, fixed income side of things, we're seeing more volatility now during you know. Our, this is more like a pre-financial crisis situation. During the financial crisis, the Fed obviously intervened there. We've seen very low volatility over the past you know, decade or so, but we're getting back to to more uh, more normal scenario. One of the key features of this fund, when you compare it to just owning the bonds, is the the higher level of distribution. So they're targeting ten plus percent. And my question, a pretty simple question to them, I felt was. Um, under what circumstances will that change? You know, is that a locked in number or you know, what would make that number uh, fluctuate up and down? So uh, each of the guys uh, had something to add here. So I'll start with what Pat had to say. Yeah, so we're quite comfortable with a 10% plus yield in, in the current environment. The main driver that's going to drive the, the percentage yield is really gonna be the direction of the underlying treasury bond ETFs. So basically when prices fall, the percent yield will rise uh, and vice versa. If prices rise, the percentage yield will drop. Really what we're trying to do with this, with this ETF with H bond is to deliver a fairly consistent dollar amount to investors on a monthly basis. It might have some very slight variability within a, a narrow band, um, but as it sits today, um, we're, you know, we're very comfortable with providing a 10% plus yield to our investors. Just to give it a, a bit of color on our, our approach, like our cover call approach is to sell um, at the money uh, option, which is, you know, cover uh, call, sorry, that are where the strike is very close to where the current price of the underlying is, uh, in this case, the long bond ETF. That is what gets us the most premium. Now, the trade off is that, you know, we do give up uh, the upside from that level. And so you're not going to get, you're only going to get modest growth on the portfolio. You're not going to get, the, you know, the full growth. Um, but the nice thing about that is that that's where you get the most premium. and so in order to get the distributions and the, and the yields that we're targeting for the product, uh, you know, we feel comfortable that, you know, we don't need to, uh, we can always, we can always 
find uh, the right options to write to to generate the the distributions that that we're making. And certainly, that's that's what we found with our other uh, Max Suite ETFs that we we currently um, run on the equity side. As Pat points out, the main driver uh, is the direction of the underlying assets. So as I said at the beginning of this video, when prices fall, yields are going to rise and vi vice versa. Uh, he said that you would expect to see some fluctuations within a narrow band. Uh, Nick uh, added that the uh, the run writing the at the money uh, calls, you get the most premium. So you, you sacrifice that upside. But he is confident as the, the, the fund manager here that he will be able to find options to write uh, sufficiently to generate and hit that 10% target. Now, suitability is a big question. I, I own bonds in my portfolio, and I know a lot of younger investors don't own bonds. So the question I had uh, to the guys was, is there a benefit um, only to age demographic to an, an older crowd like me, um, or is it more applicable across the board? And, and I asked Pat specifically about that suitability. This is what he had to say. Yeah, I don't think it really matters how much they have, but really if they have a fixed income allocation at all, this can be a sleeve within that. As long as the investor understands the trade-offs inherent with cover call strategies, the same applies to age bond as it would to equity cover call ETFs, is that you're generating additional monthly income um, but you're capping some of your upside potential. Uh, that's the trade-off inherent with them. So we really think that this can fit as a as a nice yield-oriented position within their fixed income allocation. It's a it's a the it allows an ability to get a much higher yield than you would get from other categories of fixed income without taking on additional credit risk. And I think that's an important variable here too. What you're taking on with H bond is some rate risk. Um, but when you compare that to high yield bonds, for example, that are yielding six or seven percent. Uh, you're getting, you know, you're taking on significant credit risk there. So we think this is a, a very good fit for income investors as a as a sleeve, um, as long as they're focused on income. My takeaway from what Pat said is basically, um, if you have a fixed income sleeve in your portfolio in the first place, then this may be a suitable uh, investment. You wouldn't necessarily go out and buy this just because it's got a covered call overlay. Um, if you don't want bonds in the first place, this is probably not something you would add. But if you do have a component of bonds in your portfolio, um, this is uh, an option for a portion of that. Um, he did reiterate again that trade-off of the equity cap. Uh, that said, he said that you have um, rate risk in a fund like this, but not the credit risk as you're buying um, U.S. treasuries. Taxation is another point I asked them about. I just asked for a quick uh, confirmation of tax treatment. And in Canada here, registered versus non-registered. Uh, and Pat addressed that question. I think one of, the, one of the most attractive features of this fund really is the tax efficiency. So the, the yield that comes from the underlying treasury bond ETFs is roughly 4% right now. Um, but all the additional income is being generated from Nick and his team generating uh, premium income from the covered calls. So here in Canada, uh, premium income is generally uh, taxed as capital gains. So this is a much more tax efficient way of, of getting income in your, in your fixed income side. Just to sort of summarize what Pat said, the yield from the underlying bonds um, is regular taxation and pure bond interest is taxed at a higher rate than capital gains. Now with the options premium income that comes in with the structure of this fund, that's taxed as a capital gain. So in a registered account, that wouldn't make any difference, RIF, RSP, etc. But in a taxable account, there is a significant a benefit to having this capital gains income as opposed to interest income. I then moved on to risk because I'm assessing what bonds I personally want to own in my portfolio here. And usually, pretty much always, a higher yield means that you're taking on higher risk. You're going into corporate bonds, you're going, you know, delving into junk bonds, et cetera, to generate that higher yield. So I asked the guys, uh, you know, what do I need to be aware of or how does this fund address the issue of risk? So uh, I'll just share with you what each of them had to say. Yeah, so I think that's a that's a very uh, important point on this fund. Really, is with H bond, you're getting an attractive 10% plus target yield without taking on additional credit risk. So you're getting 100% exposure to U.S. Treasuries, which have virtually zero credit risk. Uh, you do take on rate risk, as I as I mentioned earlier. Um, but you know, like I said, you know, we if if you look at the the fixed income category, um, the highest yielding uh, component of that is the high yield bond sector. You do take on a fair amount of uh, credit risk, uh, and you're getting a lower yield. You're getting a yield on average of six or seven percent on uh, high yield bond ETFs. Here, you're getting a ten percent yield that, without taking on additional credit risk, and it's also much more tax efficient, as I said earlier, uh, because of the premium income generated from the uh, options. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, you know, usually when it comes to fixed income, there's kind of 
two two ways to really get a, additional yield. Uh, you know, the first one is to go further out by by going longer uh, maturities because it's a little bit riskier, and so uh, you, you usually get compensated for that. Uh, the second is through through credit risk, um, which is you know by the riskiness of the borrower. You you know if the if there's a risk that the borrower won't pay you back. You know, then obviously you should require a higher yield for that. So generally, those those have been the two ways that you can you can get extra yield in the fixed income market. And what I like about H1 and this strategy is this, you now have you know a third way to get additional yield, and that is to monetize that volatility um, through the through the cover call overlay. Uh, in addition, you and, you and as Pat pointed out, in addition you get that tax efficient because of the uh, the, the cover call premiums are are taxed as capital. And, and not as income, and, and so I really, um, you know, I really think that, you know, from the underlying point of view, we're not, we're not, we're just investing in U.S. Treasuries, and we're not taking any credit risk. So, it, it's a nice additional tool in your toolbox. So Pat pointed out there a benefit of this structure is that you get additional yield, but you don't take on more credit risk. You're buying U.S. Treasuries. You do take on a rate risk. We've talked a lot about that here today. So there is um, you know, no question about that. But you avoid the credit risk that is inherent in the high risk space. Um, Nick talked about ways that you can increase yield. First of all, he talked about longer maturities. Typically, traditionally, longer term maturities have higher yield. He said you can go up that risk scale so you can increase the credit risk. Uh, more yield, but more likelihood of defaults. And then the third way you talked here about H bond um, is the way to create that additional yield is to monetize the volatility, and that is exactly what we're seeing with a with a fund like H bond. The last question I pose to the guys is uh, around the topic of liquidity. And with a new ETF, you hear a lot of people, maybe some naysayers, who are saying, "Well, it's a new fund, so there is a, it's smaller in in dollar amount, so there won't be." much liquidity. Now, uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable with, it, with this, but I thought I would ask them that question and, and share their answer with uh, the audience here. So I spoke, uh, our both both Nick and Pat answered that. Um, I'll share that now and then I'll come back and comment on it. The great news on that front is the, the ETFs that we own in the portfolio are amongst the largest e bond ETFs in the world, really. Um, you know, uh, a, a TLT, which which is 50% of the fund, um, that is currently over a 40 you know billion dollar uh, market cap uh, bond ETF. And then, you know, on, on top of that, uh, you know, you, the underlying for for these ETFs is the U.S. Treasury market, which is uh, by far the most liquid uh, Treasury market in the world. The reserve currency uh, with you know close to zero credit risk. So you know. This is pretty much one of the most uh, uh, liquid uh, underlying, you know, asset classes, and we all know government debt's not going away anytime soon. So there's going to there's going to be plenty of debt to go around. Um, but and then finally, there's the options market uh, because uh, and and TLT has uh, currently uh, TLT has the most liquid uh, options market in the U.S. for any bond ETF, and so you know, you know we're we're a, a Canadian ETF provider. We're certainly not going to push the needle on any liquidity issues in, in, in that market. Yeah, it's definitely not a concern with this ETF um, uh, or any of our ETFs for that matter. The key for investors to look at when judging liquidity of an ETF is always what's the underlying, what's the liquidity of the underlying. So here in our case, uh, I'll just give the example of HMAX and UMAX. These are you know large liquid financials and Canadian utilities companies with H bond, we're in very large liquid US Treasury bond ETF. So uh, it's very easy. That's where all the liquidity uh, comes from is from the underlying, I would say. So yeah, it's pretty clear to me that when you're looking at an ETF like this, what really matters is the underlying security. If you're buying an asset class, that is very liquid. You're going to get that. That's going to flow through. And you know, Nick commented here, they're buying the largest ETFs in the world, right? The US Treasury market is the most liquid in the world and uh, TLT has the, the most uh, liquid options market in the entire US. So I'm not worried at all about liquidity there. Uh, Pat, I think quite rightly uh, said that, you know, it's not a concern. Uh, the key again is the underlying the underlying fund. So from a liquidity perspective, uh, I'm left with a high degree of comfort that it's not going to be uh, an issue. So again, I was very fortunate and pleased that uh, both Pat and Nick would set some time aside to answer my questions. And it definitely helped me confirm 
in my mind what the most important points I needed to know in order to make uh, my decision. And yes, despite the fact that I rarely buy ETFs for my portfolio, and that's simply because I prefer uh, to own individual securities, um, in this fixed income space, I did take a position in H bond. And uh, be honest, I didn't really just take a nibble. I actually took a material position for my portfolio. Uh, like the guys that suggested, though, I didn't put my entire fixed income portion into one fund. I do agree, though, that this fund will uh, will play a role for me. Uh, it will provide some steady income on, into my portfolio, and it will allow for some upside potential when those yields do reverse. But I do also hold a substantial portion of my fixed uh, fixed income sleeve in more traditional bond holdings, at least at least for the time being. So once again, um, thank you, Pat. Thank you, Nick, for sharing your knowledge with me and then ultimately with our viewers. Hope you all found value in watching this, this video. Uh, as always, I will put a link to our Investing Academy in the description of this video. Thanks so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.